Good afternoon, I'm Karen Buller with the Santa Fe Indigenous Center and I'm here today with Christine Means and she's graciously agreed to tell us about her experience with murdered and missing Indigenous women. Christine, what happened with you? Um, in 2015, uh, my oldest sister, my oldest sibling, she was murdered in Gallup, in Gallup, New Mexico. and. Um, it's not been ruled a homicide, official homicide case. The case is still open and pending. Uh, and we, as a family, we've really had to fight for it to be, even be looked at as a potential homicide and murder case. Um, so since 2015, now going on seven years, we've been working um, to keep her case moving, to keep the police detectives uh, working with her case so that it's active and being investigated. Which police force looked into it at first? The the Gallup Police Department. And have the Navajo Police or the BIA? No, jurisdiction-wise, it was within city limits. Oh. So it has always been a city Gallup, the city of Gallup, the Gallup Police Department. It's always been their jurisdiction. Were you satisfied with how they looked into it? No, we were not. And initially, we were um, in communication, I mean, within hours after her death we were in communication even before but once she was uh, once she had passed because she she passed in the hospital from injuries um, so initially we worked with the police we were very uh, in a lot of communication we set meetings right away we, we let them know what our expectations were uh, that we were available for anything that they needed my mom was very involved with my sister in her life and she knew a lot of the people who she had been around uh, for potential witnesses, so we were very, uh, we were very open, and we wanted to work with them at first, and we did. We stayed in contact. They stayed in touch with us, and then about, I'm gonna say maybe six months. That feels a little gracious. Um, the communication just dropped off and stopped completely. From so, the police, they yeah. quit talking to you. Yeah, the police. We stopped hearing from them, and it became a we're waiting on this. We need these results. You know, we're it's a process, and it's going to take time. So let us do our job. That's what we heard. So we backed off. We gave space. We gave time, and um, eventually the calls just stopped coming all together. And people moved positions. Different. Officials went out, elected officials, because it was all the way up to the district attorney's office. Um, and it just, it stopped. And so that was what was the most frustrating part. Um, that has been one of the most frustrating parts over the last seven years, is the um, the lack of communication and the lack of action. And, and I feel like... Um, you know, I've really had to stay involved and I've really had to advocate and ask for resources and um, find different pathways to get updates. And that's really what has started all of this for us. And that's what what brought me to the work of MMIW and MMIWR was feeling helpless, feeling like we reached a stopping point and feeling like we were almost put at a stopping point and it, it was very frustrating. Do you feel like the police would have treated you differently if you weren't Native American? Um, I don't know, because I think in Gallup, the majority of people, the majority of the community is Native. Uh, and, you know, I grew up in Gallup. I have a lot of family there. I know people who work in all levels of the offices. Like, we walk into this office, this district, these different law enforcement, and I know people. There's people I went to high school with. There's mm -hmm. relatives. There's my cousin's husband. And um, so I don't know. I don't know if in, you know, in the border towns that it can be pinpointed as a race issue, although we know in a bigger context it certainly is. Um, I'll say that, but then I also understand that because of what is happening with the crimes around missing and murdered indigenous women, that yes, it, it specifically affected my sister because of who she was. And I do believe that along the way in her, in her time of when she needed help, um, because she was in an abusive relationship and there was a, a, a perpetrator over and over. It was the same person. It was her partner. Um, in that time, 
to the time that the police were called the day of. Um, the police went to their uh, residence three times that day, each time with a phone call of a report that there was violence happening, that there was abuse, there was crying, there was bleeding, there was visual evidence. And um, each time they left. And finally, the third time when they came back, it was with an ambulance because she was unconscious. Mm -hmm. So was this person ever charged? No. And why do you think that was? Oh, man, that's a hard one. This person was not charged. And um, I think it's because there was some, you know, the job was not finished. I think that the job was not finished. I think that it was not a very clear-cut, obvious case. Um, and I think that there was a lot of big gaps of information there was a lot of big gaps of what needed to be proved as evidence. And as time went on, the next day, um, you know, more crimes happened because in Gallup, the crime rate is really, really high. And that's something I understand. And that's something when we talk to these officials, we stress that. We know since the day of her passing, I mean, within the first six months, we had known the headlines in the newspaper the next day were body found here. You know, the crime rate is so high there that we were always very understanding. Um, but we always made it very clear that as family members, we did not want her case overlooked. Um, not that anybody's case should be overlooked, but that we were right. in particular going to stay in contact on this case, that we were going to follow up and that we would continue to stay in contact with them. Um, so I think it's, it's, I don't know if we were ever treated differently, but I think the whole system in a city like Gallup is just, there's just a lot of need, there's a lot of crime, there's a lot of turnover, and it just, um... Do it, you feel like the police officers have enough training to do their job well? I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I think with what happened the day of, no. Because legally, there's a law in New Mexico, if there is a domestic violence situation, you have to remove somebody from that. Mm -hmm. You have to take one of the people and you must, it's usually the offender, you have to take them out of that situation. And it's because of what happened in this, with this day. So there was, the people who responded that day were not properly trained and they allowed this to go on. And I think that was one of our initial really big fresh frustrations. And we asked why, and we asked why, but in the way things work and the way things moved, you know, we never got an answer and we couldn't, we couldn't, we didn't want to upset the police department who we were also trying to work with at the same time. So that's a, I think that was a really difficult thing. We never got an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I know that Gallup has a very high um, rate of murder to missing indigenous people and relatives. Why do you think that is? I know that's a hard question. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a hard question. And, you know, I think in my, you know, in my, because I'm, like I said, I'm from Gallup, so I'm, I'm, I grew up there. I have family there. I played sports. I like mm -hmm. the community of Gallup really raised me but I'll say in my personal experience of growing up in a place like that I saw a lot of really good and I also saw a lot of really bad and um, it taught me and in my family I knew with the teachings there you have to be very street smart um, mm -hmm. because you know you walk to your car and you may be approached by somebody mm -hmm. you're out at a party and something might be happening so for me I was always very aware of wh who I was around and what could potentially happen as far as like a fight breaking out um, and that was something that was really taught to me it was really shown to me that I have to protect myself mm -hmm. at all times in this place even though um, I have, I'm with family or I'm with friends or I'm with people I know. So I feel like I was always on guard. Um, and that was taught to me. It was taught to me by my siblings, by my family. Um, and maybe, you know, that's something that's missing. And, um, I think also Gallup being a border town, there's a lot of people who come and end up there without a safety net. You end up without a place to stay. You end up without any money. You end up going from here to there, just trying to find a place, a ride home. Maybe and by a border town, you mean it borders the reservation. Yeah, Gallup yeah. borders the Navajo reservation and then the Zuni reservation. And then out 
East is more Pueblo communities. Mm -hmm. um, so people come there to do their grocery shopping, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, and the, the population of Gallup expands tremendously mm -hmm. on the weekends and the first of the month, and then the day, other days of the week it's so quiet. So the weekends are a big time. And so I think a lot of people get stuck there and stop there, and so it just kind of collects a little bit of, of people who I think are vulnerable. I think there's a lot of vulnerable populations who come in and out, and that can be easily exploited. The other big place that has a lot of murdered and missing indigenous women is Albuquerque, and you live there now, right? Yeah, yeah, I live in so Albuquerque. So what do those two places share that makes people vulnerable? Is it because they're on Interstate 40? Mm. Um, gosh. I've heard Albuquerque is the biggest truck stop in the world. And that's why it happens. Do you think that has something to do with it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think so. I think for sure there's definitely a, a, a population, a, a, a transportation. You know, it's mm -hmm. coming and going. It's You can hop on the interstate and be somewhere very quickly. Um, and, you know, like I said, when I, I think of my family, I remember a story of my auntie sharing with me because one of the communities I grew up in, Fort Wingate, is right off of the interstate. Right. And I remember when I was younger, she shared her story with me, and it pre she pretty much told me. Um, I came across a young woman who had been picked up by a trucker. She was hitchhiking. And I was young. I, was, I still didn't quite understand the story, but basically she was sexually assaulted by the trucker and left on um, mm. near the exit. And I don't know if she was telling me, maybe she was talking to somebody, but she knew I was old enough to hear the story. And that always stuck with me. I knew right then and there uh, what that meant. And so I think it's just sharing those types of experiences and hearing them that allowed me to be very careful in the way I moved. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of times you see people and you know that they're in a very dangerous situation. So do you think we need to educate our native population more about how to be careful? Oh yeah, yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I've I've really, really come to uh, try because I think when it comes to information and you know what it is I have control over, I can do these things, I can advocate for my sister's case, uh, but the reality is that, you know, is, is one portion of life. And then I think the other thing is, being a mom and an auntie and somebody who works in communities and has access to people who are younger, it's, I think it's prevention and it's talking to our kids really young about violence and about protection and about um, being careful about how they move. And that applies to boys too, our boys and not mm -hmm. just our girls, about how we treat people. And if you see a girl in this situation, this, this is the kind of support you have to give. And uh, I think that's a big Part. I think a lot of the work that's happening and that we're doing is so reactive, like in Dion's case. You know, I'm here it is seven years, and this may go into year 10. I don't know how much mm -hmm. longer we have to go, if it'll even continue. Um, and it's all looking back, and it's all time has passed, and it's all what we've lost, and it's all been really difficult. And But I also think that the shift of my mindset going towards prevention and going towards my family, my nieces, and my people who I know uh, is prevention, and that, that feels good. There's a little bit more of so a joy in that. Here in New Mexico, we've just passed a new law that the, uh, the governor just signed. Well, not a law, but to help um, there be more awareness among the people who are in police departments and that sort of thing. Do you think that will help, and do you think that's the sort of thing the whole United States needs? Oh, yeah, I think that will really help. I think awareness and education is it, it is a tool that we need to utilize. Um, I think that the more people who know is, is really helpful, and something that, you know, when we talked to a really great ally, Captain Troy Velasquez, he's mm -hmm. with the New Mexico State Police Department, and interesting, he said, is that up until just a few years ago, he didn't realize that, that there was a pandemic, in, or what do they call it? Um, Something that's going on for a long time and a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> that he didn't realize that this, sorry, COVID is in my head now. Yeah, but he didn't course. realize that MMIW like pandemic, yeah. was such a big issue because he is always working in this scope of, it's so small. And so once he became involved in like the New Mexico State Task Force, that opened his eyes and his uh -huh. experience and his perspective. And to hear him say that was, was really 
something for me because I think, how can you not see this? How can you yeah. not know what's going on? And I think that a lot of people maybe don't choose to be ignorant, but it's just we right. don't They just see. don't know. Yeah. I know we know about it in New Mexico, but not every New Mexican knows, and this film will tell them about that. So what's the one most, if you there was someone in Hobbs or... Um, some Roy or someplace far away, what's the one thing you would want them to know about murdered and missing indigenous relatives? I think that one is the awareness. Um, of course, awareness and learning about it. I think one of the most interesting things we have here in New Mexico is that you can't go in any direction without running into tribal boundaries, tribal lands. I mean, ancestrally, it's all tribal lands, but in 2022, it's reservations. Mm -hmm. And there, I think, knowing who your neighbors are, knowing what is going on, because just because you live in a city, um, even if you're far from one of the reservations, you're still impacted by the choices of our, mm -hmm. of our neighbors. And I think respecting and supporting what tribal communities are doing. Um, I think in New Mexico, we tend to look at MMIW as an issue of Gallup, of Albuquerque, Farmington, Santa Fe. These co communities are so close to the native populations, um, but when in reality, it's, it's all over. And um, I think the other thing, and this is something we hear repeatedly, it's who our elected officials are. It's who we are putting into office, who is representing us. Is it the same person who's been in office for term after term and they're comfortable with the status quo of what's happened? Um, it's looking at the history of elected officials and seeing how did they vote. And I think that's one of the really hardest things for me to do is I, if I'm preparing for a vote, I need to go and see, did this person vote in support of this bill? Did they vote against yeah. this policy? Um, because that will tell you who their allies are, who our allies are, and what people are working with. And I think people who work for the basic necessities of human dignity and humanity are the ones that I want in office. And that applies for everybody across all boards, um, across all different reservations and boundaries and city limits. Because you see a lot of the officials who, you see the work they support. So and it just hurts who we are as people and as women. Yeah, so we want to vote for people who listen to us. Yes. And who hear what's important to us as Native people. Yeah, and represent the the goals, the... The same goals we have. Yeah, represent the same goals that we have. honor our wishes, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. My oldest sister, Dion Figuez, also known as Dion Thomas. Dion was the first board, so she was the pilot baby of my parents. The test baby. And you know what they say about the first board, they're the most beautiful, they're the strongest, and they're the best fighters. But I'm the fourth board, so we know that can't be true. <laughs> and we grew up in Gallup, New Mexico, and I'm a very proud community member of this area. Um, my older sister played a really big role in helping to guide me in my young life. A great memory I have is that Dion was there with me the day that I went to sign a, sign a letter of intent to play college volleyball. And I remember driving with Dion and my parents to the gym in Gallup, where we sat with my coaches, we took pictures for the newspaper, and it was a really big moment. I remember Dion sat with me and she smiled. And she printed, I printed a hard copy of this photo that I shared with her. And it's just a forever, a, a sweet memory of us together. And it was her there cheering me on as I moved forward in life, leaving my younger years and moving into something else that would be bigger and a greater opportunity for me. Um, my sister Dion had, an, had a very amazing sense of humor. She had the ability to make fun of everyday life. And I think as I grow older and I see the responsibilities and so much happening, I really have a great respect for this because it's, that's a hard thing to do. Uh, her humor was very witty and it was fast and she could come up with teasing jokes in no time and that always frustrated me because I couldn't come up with a quick response to her jokes and I'm still like this today. Um, so Dion was the oldest child of my family and I had two, I have two older sisters, I had two older sisters. Um, they were both kids of the 90s and I remember Dion had great big hair. 
I remember the smell of Aquanet when they would get ready in the mornings for school. I remember they had the ash, acid wash jeans before they were cool. And both of my sisters introduced me to different types of music. Um, Dion was Guns N' Roses, and my sister Karen was the Violent Femmes. And it's because of them I had a, a good array of music growing up as a kid. Um, and they were both very cool, original 90s kids before it was a trend. Over a tragic 10 year span, I watched as Dion's life began to change. She was in an abusive relationship, and through these years, she lost her independence, her identity, her family, and she was bullied, intimidated, isolated, threatened, hospitalized, ambulanced, jailed. She attempted to leave many times, and each time was drawn back to the relationship. Seven years ago, almost to this day, we buried her, my family and I. And each day, myself and her children, we cope every day knowing that she is gone. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge her daughters who are here with me tonight. And I want to thank you for being here. For me, for showing up for your mom, and most importantly, showing up for yourself tonight. The details of Dion's case are saddening and frustrating. And initially, we put trust in the process that we were told to follow by law enforcement. After a period of time had passed, we decided that we had to take action. We had to take another route. I had heard about the New Mexico Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's and Relatives Task Force, and this was around 2017. It was starting to form here in the state of New Mexico. I was desperate for help. We were getting no answers. We were getting no leads from law enforcement. Her case was sitting cold. I reached out to the task force. I was reaching out to anyone at the time in the realm of MMIW. Some of those people were, are here today. I Googled reports and organizations online because at the time the movement was spreading from Canada down south, so a lot of the resources were very limited. Um, I eventually connected with the New Mexico Indian Affairs Office. Secretary Lynn Trujillo and her staff, Stephanie Salazar, responded to me in an email, and it was the first time that we were treated with dignity in the whole process of, pro of my sister's case from the time of her death. They treated us in a way that was very respectful. They validated our experiences, and I'm so grateful to the Office of the New Mexico Indian Affairs who started the task force to Secretary Trujillo, Stephanie, and I believe they may be here this evening. So if they're here, I just really want to acknowledge them. And if you work with them in any capacity in this work, they are very heartfelt and they do everything that they can within their power to push forward the work that's happening in MMIW in New Mexico, MMIWR. And it's because of them and a lot of the people in the MMIWR movement that I'm here today, they just, supported me, they gave me space, they gave me the opportunity to talk, and I want to say thank you for that. And something I've come to realize is that I started this process with full intention and with my full grieving heart, thinking that I was in this fight for justice for my sister. And initially I was, I wanted to do this all for Dion. I knew if I lived a life where I did not exhaust resources for her, for her case, that I couldn't live in a good way. And as the years passed, I've tried so many different things, very uncomfortable, difficult things like standing here today. And a hard truth that I've come to realize is that this was about me as much as it has been about my sister. It has been about my grief and my healing. And I had so much pent up energy and emotion that would have eventually turned me into a toxic person had I not acted. So I did the only thing that I could. I asked for help. And I've been angry. I was angry the years of her abuse. I was angry immediately the minute I heard she had been airlifted to the University of New Mexico Hospital. I've been angry throughout this process of her going from our loved person, her body, her hands, everything about her that I grew up admiring, to becoming a case on someone's desk, where that case was moved to another desk and then onto another person's desk, and eventually forgotten and pushed to the side. 
And the reality is that this all starts in anger and often it ends in anger. And I see that in all levels of the work of MMIWR, why we start it, why we get involved, and why, why we stay in it. And I think something that I've come to realize that we, is that we have to believe that there is an end to this. I don't know what it looks like, but I do know that today I have a choice. We all have a choice. And I think something about the people who show up to these rallies is that we are the strong ones. We show up repeatedly. We bear the responsibility. And in order to sustain this fight, we have to be our own advocates. When we get so far in with all of the responsibilities, we lack the capability to see the bigger picture. And I just wanna take this moment to ask you to stop and take a breath and feel the energy that we have here today as a collective, as the person next to you, as somebody who you don't know. Whether that energy be from anger, sadness, rage, shame, grief, we have to recognize that there can be a shift of energy and that we have the ability to control myself and only me. My healing is what I have today. And I just want to recognize everybody in this space who came out to support and say thank you for this. And I don't want to become a victim. There's been violence against my family, against my sister, against my community. And we have to actively, I am actively seeking closure. We have to keep moving forward. And we need to give ourselves permission to speak, but also to be quiet. So many times in this work, we're asked to show up and we're asked to do this work and we do it because we have to, because had I not taken the steps I did it, I wouldn't have gotten any movement on my sister's case. But in the long run, I haven't been able to heal because I keep going back and I keep showing up because I've absolutely had to, we've had to. And we all will deal with things differently at our own pace and sometimes family members will go in different directions and that's a really hard thing when you're processing grief. Today I brought my voice and I just want you to know how honored I am for this opportunity to speak. It's something I don't take lightly. I am one voice and that's what we can do together. We can all speak up, your community, we can demand and uphold our managers in our place of work directors of organizations, leaders, business owners, to support the rights of women, to support and protect indigenous women. And when the time is right, and you feel it, act on your voice and use it. I think an action that we can take today, we can take tomorrow, is to ask yourself, how do I handle myself? How do I move in my community? My health, how do I handle my health and those around me? We cannot wait on the agencies and the organizations. We have to pledge to uphold ourselves and those around us. We have to talk to our children, our boys, our girls, young men, young women about abuse and violence. We have to tell them how they should be treated. Violence and abuse are insidious. They are there in the dark corners of all of our lives preventing our babies from growing up with any thoughts that abuse is okay is our ultimate responsibility. And when we go home, I encourage you to think about the words we can speak into our young relatives so that we can start on a, a new path of prevention of this cycle of violence and abuse in our families, in our own homes, because that's the only change that we can really make today. And I'll just close this out with a big thank you to the Three Sisters Collective coordinating today and tonight has taken a lot of work and energy. And I think these pictures are of some of the members of Three Sisters Collective behind. So I wanna recognize them because I know that they do an amazing job of showing up in the space of the plaza, a place that has a place that has, at any time I've ever been here, reserved for tourists and reserved for money making and reserved for trade and that's the history of the Santa Fe Plaza so it's amazing to be here tonight 
I know that Three Sisters Collective did a damn good job of making space for us and all of our collective energy and movement. So thank you to Three Sisters Collective. Um, I appreciate you all. I see the grandmas, the aunties, the moms, and the sisters here tonight. And I just want you all to know that I thank you so much for being here and for being there for your children. And I can see you with your 90s hair. And I think that you are the ultimate ones that we all love and deserve. And I really hope that you saved your jeans and your crop tops from the 90s because they're back. Yeah.